Hello. Welcome to Four Stories, Four Questions, a dialogue on the humanities, our end of term event for the 2020-2021 Institute for Humanities Research Faculty Fellows Cohort. I'm Liz Grumbach. I'm the Assistant Director of the IHR, and we're so glad that you're joining us here today. This year's IHR Faculty Fellows event will showcase the stories and questions that have inspired the fellows research projects. This event is an invitation to discuss the narratives that fuel humanities research with the intention to reflect on how interdisciplinary conversations can lead to new and needed knowledge of the human experience in an age of dehumanization. This fellows cohort due to COVID-19 was actually never able to meet in person. And during the course of their fellowship, a pandemic and the continuing fight for racial and social justice changed the way academia and the world operated. Perhaps because of these challenges, this year's cohort became interested in why the humanities matter right now and how to tell stories of how the humanities matter. And that's what we're here to do together today. It's really a pleasure to introduce and moderate this event today, and it's been an honor to help facilitate conversations amongst this amazing group of scholars for the past year. Thank you for inviting me into your conversations, y'all, and I really look forward to hearing your presentations. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping things. Automated closed captioning um, has been or will be activated for this event. Um, please feel free to say hello and comment during the event today, either on our YouTube live stream or um, on Zoom. Our panelists will be able to see these during the event and I will be moderating Q&A. To pose a question for our speaker today in the Zoom webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're on YouTube, please use the YouTube chat function and our moderator on YouTube will relay those questions to us. Feel free to pose a question at any time during the event. And now it is a pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today. Dave Fossum is an assistant professor in the School of Music. Combining extensive ethnographic fieldwork and archival research, he studies ideas about creativity and intellectual property, focusing particularly on music in Turkey and Central Asia. He is currently writing a monograph titled Modernizing Musical Creativity and Intellectual Property in Turkey. This book examines how concepts of musical creativity inform and are shaped by Turkey's cultural policy particularly in state broadcasting and in the realm of intellectual property law and administration. Dave Fossum will be presenting Where Do Folk Songs Come From? And Dave, I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Liz. In May 2014, in the Turkish district of Soma, over 300 people died in an explosion in a coal mine sparking a nationwide wave of protests about working conditions and possible government complicity in the accident. I was living in Turkey at the time, conducting ethnographic research about creativity and intellectual property in the country's music industry. The mining tragedy put my Turkish friends and colleagues in a state of shock and grief. As the country was still abuzz in conversation in the days after the event, I interviewed Mehmet Erenler, an instrumental virtuoso, folk music ensemble director, and frequent performer for Turkish radio and television, the official state broadcasting organization better known as the TRT. We sat having tea at a cafe overlooking the Bosphorus in the quiet northern reaches of Istanbul where he lived. I had wanted to meet with Erenler because of his connections with the TRT and its paradigm of musical folklore. In Turkish musical folklore, there was a recurring debate as to whether it is possible for an individual to compose a turku, a Turkish language folk song, or whether real turkus had to be anonymously and collectively created. As we talked about this, the mining tragedy came to his mind. The things that will come out about that, the things the people will come up with, he said, and by things he meant turkus. But won't those be compositions, I asked? But if it reflects the shared feelings of the people, he replied, there are local musicians there. They give that people's feelings a voice. That won't be a composition. Do we have the shared feelings and thoughts of the people who live in that region or individual personal feelings? These turkus don't fall from the sky in a basket. They have a producer. There's a person who produces it, someone who creates it. But in order to create them, they draw on the people's shared feelings and thoughts. The ideas that Erenler expressed about how turkus came to be, how they emerged not as compositions by an individual, but rather from a process 
that made them anonymous expressions of a collective was familiar to me by this point in my research. In Turkey, this imagined anonymity creates um, a romantic aura around folk music, adding to its appeal as a shared cultural heritage in terms of which many people in Turkey understand themselves and their history. But for many of those who have studied and promoted folk music, Turkus are not simply anonymous because their authors have been forgotten. Rather, they imagine the process through which Turkus emerge to differ fundamentally from the process of artistic creativity in other genres. As a Turku passes through time and spreads through space, so the story goes, it gets reshaped in the mouths of many singers, gradually erasing any trace of the individual who first uttered its lines. There were reasons to doubt these ideas about how Turkus come to be. During my research, I talked to musicians who claimed they had composed original Turkus and pretended to have collected them from a grandmother or an uncle in a remote village. Before the 1990s, the TRT had a monopoly on television and radio. As a folk music artist, if you wanted your Turku to be heard, you wanted it to be broadcast. But the TRT folk music division had a policy that all Turkus in its approved broadcast repertoire had to be anonymous, not a contrived invention of some urban artist. I had also researched Turkus that had existed in some form for a long time, but individual artists had reshaped them significantly, putting them into a form that appealed to a broad audience and became the popular version. Were such individuals really just passive mouthpieces for some collective feeling, or were they authors of a sort? In my research, I probed the story about anonymity, tracing its origins to 19th century theories of European folklore. I was hoping to expose it as ideological nonsense. But then there were reasons to take the anonymity idea seriously. In the 1940s, the leftist author Yashar Kemal documented how the women in rural villages created odds, the songs of mourning that they sang and recrafted in the hours and days following the death of a loved one. He tried to reconstruct which woman had composed which verse in an odds for Ibish, the son of a village dervish. Ibish's odds was, quote, composed by all the women of his village. I didn't collect Ibish's odds from one woman I took a part of it from more or less every woman in the village. I tried to get the name of the woman who had composed each part of it, but everything had gotten so mixed up together that I couldn't sort it out, and I began simply writing down the verses." End quote. The women of the village had spun out the art as a collaborative endeavor, building upon each other's kernels of ideas and passing them around. The best arts spread and became turkus, known all over the place. Keeping track of authors hardly matters in such contexts. Why then was I so eager to deconstruct the anonymity idea? Recently, I've become concerned about my own instincts to expose the anonymity idea as ideological nonsense. There's a history of Western researchers traveling to study people who lived outside the global north, who mostly had darker skin, who believed in unfamiliar ideas that seemed exotic. Was I reproducing this pattern? I can argue the point either way. Perhaps my instinct to critique the anonymity idea was grounded in a condescending attitude about the beliefs of my research subjects. And while I'm familiar with the idea that the author is dead, that every text is a tissue of quotations, I could be trying to reproduce a Western epistemology of authorship. By highlighting the individuals who play a role in forming turkus, I could be assuming that creative works come from individual genius and I could be denying the validity of epistemological difference that Turkish, Turkish folk songs really could emerge in some other way. On the other hand, the idea that people in the East are somehow more collective, less individual than people in the West, is a recurring Orientalist trope. I had initially seen my critiques of the anonymity idea as attempts to unsettle this trope, championing the individuals whose creative agency it minimized. Was I wrong to do so? In his book about songs of mourning, Kamal writes that in every village he visited, there was someone who knew the Yemen Turku, a famous folk song written for the countless Ottoman soldiers who were shipped off to fight, for local, fight local rebels and the British in Yemen, never to be seen again. It was songs like this one that made it easy for musicians like Erenler to imagine locals near Soma pouring out their grief into sung poetry in the wake of the mining tragedy. The Yemen Turku captures the grief of families who sent sons to war, asking, 
There's, there's not a cloud in the sky. So what is that? No one is not in the sky. What is that sky? Oh, that is a flower and Whoever goes there never Perhaps the core, the question at the core of my story then is not where do folk songs come from, but what is at stake in my answer? Thank you. Dave, thank you so much for that. And thank you for the provocation at the end of the presentation. There are several things that are going to stick with me there, but especially towards the end, like, are we imposing individuality? Are we deconstructing tropes? Like, I really look forward to discussing that with you, you and this group later. Thank you, Dave. Our next presenter today will be Anna Hedberg Olenina, who is an assistant professor of comparative literature and media studies at the School of International Letters and Cultures, and will hopefully forgive me for, um, for the mispronunciation. Her teaching and research interests include 20th century Russian literature and cinema, international film history, as well as film theory with an emphasis on media archaeology, spectatorship, and performance. Her book, Psychomotor Aesthetics, Movement and Affect in Modern Literature and Film, published by Oxford University Press in 2020, traces the ways in which early film directors, actors, and performance theorists used the psychological ideas of their time to conceptualize expressive movement and transference of emotion. Anna Hedberg Olenina will present what can neuroscience tell us about the experience of watching films. It's such a pleasure to have you here, Anna. And I'll hand the mic over to you, but unfortunately you are there. Thank you very much, Liz. I'm really excited to be here. It's been a very productive and interesting year uh, of, of the fellowship, and I'm excited to share my research. Over the past 20 years, evolving technologies have allowed us to map the activity of the brain with unprecedented precision. Neuroscience has advanced to the level where it is rapidly transforming our understanding of emotions, empathy, reasoning, love, morality, and free will. What is at stake today is our sense of the self, who we are, how we act, how we experience the world, and how we interact with it. By now, nearly all mental states have been tied to some particular patterns of brain activity. These studies have far-reaching consequences. Neuroscientists are establishing norms and deviations. They make predictions about our behavior based on processes that lie outside of our conscious control and knowledge. These authoritative statements coupled with impressive images, impressive brain images, have a mesmerizing effect on our society. We are ready to believe uh, the claims of neuromarketers that they can tell for sure, let's say, which, which politician you are likely to vote for, even if you haven't made up your mind yet. Your brain already exhibits a preference, even if you don't know this yourself. There is a joke. A judge asks the suspect, why did you commit the crime? And the guy answers, my brain made me do it. Right? In highlighting brain processes, neuroscience brackets off questions of agency, free choice, creativity, and unpredictable behavior. Neuroscience foregrounds a biological explanation while downplaying social, cultural, and psychological ones. That is downplaying the traditional domains of the humanities, pushing the humanistic inquiry out of the arena. As a humanist, I want to put in some critical checks in my own area of film and media studies, where we've got neurocinematics, a fascinating new direction which relies on fMRI scans to map the activation of spectators' brain uh, during film screenings. Now imagine if you were a film producer and you wanted to make sure that your investment in the production pays off, that you make a film that the audience are guaranteed to enjoy. 
Well, the firm of Peter Katz uh, called Neurocinematics is here to help. This firm will test out your film on a viewer placed in the fMRI machine. Well, let's say it's a horror film. Katz claims that he can tell exactly which scenes evoke a strong sense of fear when the amygdala are activated and which scenes are not so gripping and therefore must be reshot or re-edited. This claim is remarkable, but it really oversimplifies things. Do you watch horror films simply to get frightened or do you also watch them to overcome your fears, to learn how to cope with uh, the traumatic or incomprehensible aspects of the human existence? Are the things that you perceive as frightening universal or unique to you based on your age, your cultural background, your life experiences? Is this kind of gripping suspense and instant gratification of our senses the essence of art as such? Or is there more to, than, more to art, right? More than that, that it can offer in terms of changing our worldview, shattering stereotypes and cliches, making us think critically, empathetically, and imaginatively. These are the kinds of questions a humanist would ask. They concern the nature of aesthetic experience, its social and cultural underpinning, and its broader implications for cultural politics. In film studies, neuroscience has attached itself to the so-called cognitivist constructivist school. Scholars like David Bordwell, Noel Carroll, Carl Plantinga, Ed Tan, Tor Torben Grodal, whose research focuses primarily on mainstream Hollywood narrative film. They study the way in which the viewer follows the plot line and forms guesses and predictions about what is to come next. This the school is called constructivist because it studies the cues or prompts that the film form gives to the viewer while guiding her guesses and expectations. A simple example, we see the hero looking at something intensely and we are biologically wired to ask, what is he looking at? Is it dangerous? Is it useful? Next shot, the object of the actor's attention. Our curiosity is satisfied. And Hollywood uses this very simple trick called the eyeline match to cover up the cut and create a seamless logical transition between the actor's expression and the object. Now, the constructivist scholars contend that Hollywood has tapped into a very basic biological pre-wired mechanism of human perception to deliver the most effective uh, uh, fi film experience, right? The most gripping form uh, that completely uh, absorbs the viewer. The constructivist school arose in opposition to the so-called grand theory, which dominated film studies from the 70s through the 90s. The grand theory relied on psychoanalysis and continental philosophy to deliver poignant ideological critique of mainstream commercial cinema with all of its bourgeois politics, its gender and race stereotypes, and its mindless brainwashing. Now, the constructivist film scholars wanted to recuperate Hollywood films from these accusations by showing that the viewer uh, is, is by far not a passive consumer, but someone whose mind is constantly responding to prompts, making predictions and drawing conclusions. But in rejecting the sweeping assumptions of grand theory, constructivists, constructivists put forward a number of problematic new assumptions. One of which is that watching films is very much like experiencing events in reality, right? They don't want to speak about mediation. They want to look into the kind of our pre-wired uh, biological uh, mechanisms uh, as a homo sapiens uh, species, right? Uh, they highlight universal uh, or intersubjective uh, reactions, right? Intersubjectives meaning happening to many people at once, the replicable uh, reactions rather than unique culturally contingent uh, ones. And finally, they also favor Hollywood as uh, the norm, right? As the, the type of cinema that is so effective universally, uh, uh, precisely because it, it managed to harness uh, the powers of uh, our uh, perceptual apparatus. Uh, 
uncritically, uh, these uh, types of assumptions are then in interpolated into neuroscience. Uh, for example, a, a very famous uh, pioneer of neuroscience, neurocinema, Yuri Hansen, uh, I mean, he studies how brains of film watchers uh, synchronize as they uh, follow uh, suspense narratives, primarily in Hollywood, uh, of Hollywood films. Uh, so it, again, his research points to the effective film forms and uh, by, by extension, all other independent or avant-garde or, or lyrical or poetical films are considered a, a deviation, right? They, they're, not, they're not as effective in, in evoking these intersubjective reactions. Um, but luckily, there are also uh, new, new directions in film studies, which also begin to draw on neuroscience and try to um, inject some of these humanistic uh, questions about uh, uh, about uh, our cognitive uh, processes uh, that are kind of higher order uh, processes, uh, processes of reasoning, imagination, and memory uh, into uh, into this question of uh, embodied viewing and the role of the uh, emotional brain in uh, uh, sim simulating uh, film experiences as we watch uh, films. Uh, there is a wonderful British scholar, Maria Pulaki, uh, who speaks about uh, windows of uh, uh, um, of processing, um, which means that she, she analyzes the drawing on neuroscience, uh, the ways in which uh, when we first watch uh, 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 scenes, right, in real time, indeed our uh, brain is trying to make sense of uh, who did what, when, and what does it mean to us. But then it shows that other parts of the brain also um, uh, are activated, particularly those parts of the brain that process larger chunks of, of, of narrative and make sense of what uh, the, the full uh, sequence means, right? And, and how, uh, this, how to make sense of it given the prior cultural and psychological experiences of the person, right? So it's not just the real time uh, uh, being plugged in into the story, but it's a um, long-term effect of, of, of uh, of, of what we have watched. Um, um, there, there is a scho German scholar, Stefan Hwen, uh, who is a media scholar, and he um, uh, zooms in on the mediation, on the mediated nature of screen events. He speaks about the real-time coupling of media and the spectator's embodied mind. And he emphasizes that whenever we watch films, our, our prior interaction with various media uh, screens um, it really influences the way in which we are able or unable to suspend our disbelief and exercise our critical distance. Uh, the neuroscientist Vittorio Galese um, uh, with, and the film scholar, scholar uh, Michel Guerre um, uh, analyze uh, the embodied habits that influence uh, uh, our ability to relate to uh, uh, the, 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 the watched scenes. And, and again, like in these three examples, the emphasis, uh, uh, the, the emphasis of the scholars open, uh, opens a, the door for humanistic inquiry, for the questions of uh, psychology, uh, sociology, uh, and uh, material history of, of media. My own research focuses on the avant-garde director, Sergei Eisenstein, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, philo film philosopher um, who, uh, whose writings really emphasize the interrelation between uh, the lower and higher uh, brain processes, between emotions and cognition. Uh, he also gives us very interesting models for thinking about the spectator's immersion into the fictional world and the, the, the viewer's estrangement uh, or um, uh, a kind of Brechtian estrangement. Uh, and the, the art of uh, Sergei Eisenstein uh, really is, uh, uh, much as it is gripping, it is also a war on cliche, cliches. Uh, it is pushing the boundaries of what is possible in the art and what is possible uh, in, in society as such. So I want to end my uh, speech with this quote uh, uh, from Gilles Deleuze uh, that in creative works, there is a multiplication of emotions, a liberation of emotions and the invention of new emotions. And I hope that neuroscience is able to account for that uh, uh, incredibly wide range of creativity. Thank you.
we're all clapping in the Zoom webinar. Um, Anna, thank you so much. There are so many things that I would love to talk to you more about and have been talking to you over the past year. And I was really struck by that my brain made me do it at the beginning of your presentation. And I was thinking of it the whole way through, right, of the assumptions that we make and how we um, put critical checks into those assumptions. So thank you. Um, our next presenter today is Lynn D. Vu. Dr. Vu is an assistant professor of history in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Her first book, Governing the Dead, Martyrs, Memorials, and Necrocitizenship in Modern China, forthcoming with Cornell University Press, August 2021, examines the efforts of the Chinese nation state to record commemorate and compensate for military and civilian dead and how such efforts transformed social and cultural institutions. Her ongoing projects include war commemoration, virtuous citizenship, terrorism and insurgencies, and sovereignty at the turn of the 20th century in East and Southeast Asia. Lynn D. Vu will present Socialist Afterlives of the Empire's Dead. And I'll hand the mic over to you, Lynn. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Liz, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my, the question that I really want to ask is what happens when we die, but um, I think that would attract, you know, a very different group of audience. So I said it with um, the socialist afterlives of the empire's dead. And um, this is my new research and it's about uh, what happened to the British dead that was buried in China from the, 19, um, the 1850s to the 1950s. So it was um, 1953, three years after the founding of the People's Republic of China, the government of Shanghai issued a notice that they planned to bulldoze the bubbling well cemetery where thousands of citizens of Britain and of other national, uh, of other foreign na nations had been buried since the opening of the treaty ports in the mid 19th centuries. Uh, relatives of these dead were given the choices whether they want to leave it to the Chinese authorities to remove the graves, cremating the remains and depositing the ashes in a chapel, or sending the remains to places within the Commonwealth. Many foreign companies and missions um, had left China by this point. Consular offices were closed, except for a few. The dead could not pack up and leave like the living. And even though it was socialist China, large sums of money were needed to find these dead and um, the headstones of several tons new homes. It was no surprise that many of the relatives chose the most economical option, leaving it to, to the Chinese authorities to do um, the reburial. The graves were moved to Dazang, a site uh, 50 miles north of Shanghai. Much of the reallocation was of the headstones as the remains had mostly disintegrated in waterlogged graves. In 1954, a consular, uh, a consular staff visited the new cemetery and was pleased with the transfer. The reinterment and re erection of the headstones had been done in a very satisfactory manner. Sections and plot numbers were all clearly marked, and the graves were easily identifiable. However, all the details formally given on the headstone, such as such as um, the regimen, the dates of death, and um, um, other identical factors were chiseled away, as you see on the slide. Only names were left intact. China was eager to rid itself of its foreign presence, which was a source of humiliation dated back to the Opium Wars. Similar directives about grave requisitioning was sent out to foreign consulates throughout China. Cemeteries that served the foreign communities for decades or even close to a century were being demolished for urban development. Graves of both Chinese and foreigners were being reallocated to the suburbs to make room for the socialist state-led development. In Beijing, the British cemetery outside the west gate of the city fell into ruins after the nationalist troops destroyed during the Chinese Civil War. The British embassy tried to raise money for repair, but eventually they had to agree to have the graves moved to a large cornfield at the edge of a remote village, about eight miles outside Beijing. Consular staff 
complained about the crops growing eight feet high in the summer, completely obscuring the grapes. No visitor could find the cemetery. In addition, the Chinese authorities only installed wooden courses, and it was up to the foreign embassies to beautify the graves of their own nationals. The French had cement courses and bridge agings installed while the British could not persuade the government or any charity organization to do the same. So those graves of the British Empire's dead stayed that way for 10 years. 10 years later, in 1966, the Consul General in Beijing sent a representative to visit the British cemetery in Shanghai, but he was turned away. The French ambassador was similarly given no information about the French graves in Shanghai. It turned out that all British and other foreigner cemeteries were destroyed by the Red Guards, young students who were carrying out destruction of China in the name of the great proletarian cultural revolution. Later, a consular staff was allowed inside by an elderly great keeper, and they found that nearly every other stone had been toppled, broken, or defaced. The grave that he intended to visit was marked with a stone, um, with a stone which consisted of an open book on a low plinth. This quietness had saved it from being toppled, but the wording on the book had been tarnished by pain. Another staff attempted to visit, but he was turned away. So he drove around and found um, when he peered um, through the fences that the damage was pretty universal with few stones survived. On the morning of September 3rd, 1966, Red Guard posters were stuck on telegraph uh, poles outside the British consulate in Beijing. These posters announced in offensive language, the Red Guard intention to destroy the graves in the foreign cemetery in the suburb of Beijing and forbid visits to the cemetery. When the British protested, the council was summoned to the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the minister gave the answer that the British cemetery had contained graves of certain imperialist aggressors of the Eight Nation Army. And these aggressors had bullied the Chinese people and killed Chinese countless Chinese people. So the revolutionary masses and the Red Guards had been filled with indignation and had smashed the headstones over the graves of these imperialists. The Chinese authorities considered that the action was just and supported it. It was also just that the Red Guards had, um, forbid, had forbidden access to the cemetery. The British Council General protested but failed. The foreign office in London could only retaliate by sending a low ranking official to attend the Chinese National Day celebration that year. A few years later, in 1970, the British consulate confirmed that virtually all foreign graves in China had disappeared. In the new China, the foreign dead, which had been on the state budget as the living relatives had left them, became an obstacle to urban development and to the proletarian revolution. When the empire was retreating from its formal settlements, the mass exodus of the living effectively led to the abandonment of cemeteries, many of which existed for over a hundred years. So now you know what happened to the socialist afterlife of the empire's dead. What I cannot convey um, in this short presentation is the anxiety of the relatives when they learned about the fate of their loved one buried in China. The anxiety about the consecrated ground, about the headstones, about the possibility, possibility of their loved one being buried in a mass unidentifiable grave. And these are the stories I will tell you at a later date. Thank you very much. Lynn, thank you so much. There was powerful images, powerful emotions, powerful stories. And I think thinking about necro citizenship with you and the rights of the dead um, is something I look forward to further discussions. Thank you. Our next and our final presentation today will be by Dr. James E. Wormers. Dr. Wormers is a clinical assistant professor of humanities in the languages and cultures unit in the College of Integrative Science and Arts at ASU. Wormers writes about Shakespeare, pedagogy, and issues of race and democracy, often all at once. He teaches courses in composition, film, gender studies, literature, philosophy, and religious studies, 
and he develops and leads innovative and engaging community programs like Words on Wheels. James Wormers will present, what thoughts are we using to think other thoughts? And I'll turn the mic over to you, James. Thank you, Liz. And, and uh, uh, Dave and Anna and, and Lynn, fantastic as always. I love it. All right, here we go. The Northern Arapaho people arrived at the Wind River Reservation in present day Montana in 1878. Their forced relocation to a reservation they would be required to share with the historical enemy was only the most recent event in a long history of abuses. For decades, the Arapaho had seen their humanity ignored in favor of a relentless pursuit of land and natural resources by the US. Well, the Northern Arapaho had done their best to find common ground in the face of genocidal ambitions. Their good faith attempts had repeatedly been taken advantage of. It might have seemed like this latest indignity had pushed the Arapaho people as far as they could go, that perhaps they might finally be left alone in a place no one else seemed to want. But at Wind River, there would be no peace and no healing. Instead, members of the Northern Arapaho were about to face a new form of dehumanization. Unsatisfied with merely robbing indigenous peoples of land and resources, the United States would soon turn its sight on transforming the people themselves into human resources. The era of the non-reservation boarding schools was beginning. In 1881, a 16-year-old Arapaho boy living on the Wind River Reservation was loaded onto a train to be shipped across the country to Carlisle first non-reservation Indian boarding school funded by the federal government and a model for a system of education that would wreak untold havoc on the lives of people for years to come. Carlisle was the vision of Richard Henry Pratt, a veteran of the so-called Indian Wars. Pratt had a simple vision of a school that would, in his words, quote, kill the Indian and save the man. While schools like Carlisle were generally filled with students forcibly removed from their homes, records indicate that this young man and his companions were sent to Carlisle voluntarily and sent in hopes that they might help foster new understandings. These hopes were quickly dashed. Arriving on the grounds of Carlisle, the young man would have been confronted with unfamiliar and alienating flat landscapes watched by eyes on the reviewing balconies of coldly geometrical military buildings. Ushered into those buildings, he would have then found himself subjected to a series of rituals designed to break his spirit. The administrators of Carlisle would have forcibly cut his hair and replaced his clothing so that any sense of individuality or pride in his ancestry was replaced by a hollow uniformity that echoed European notions of propriety. But it was not simply clothing and hair that drew the attention of the administrators at Carlisle. Names too would have to be changed. At Carlisle, the assigning of new European sounding names was accomplished by students pointing at a name on a long list. The young man had likely to almost choose a name at random, an alien name, a name impossibly distant from his own world. Where traveling companions chose names like Lincoln and Horace and Raleigh, the young man we've been following chose the name William Shakespeare. William would spend the next three years at Carlisle alongside the ghost of another man who had once borne the same name. When we look closely at the records of Carlisle, it quickly becomes clear that the Stratfordian Shakespeare was very much in circulation at the school. His work was employed as model and corrective, as an ostensible example of civilization and the need to become civilized. Quotes from plays like The Merchant of Venice, Othello, and Hamlet, often woefully out of context, were used alongside crude stereotypes to denigrate indigenous peoples. Some social gatherings and school clubs required students to uh, memorize snippets of plays and poems as moral and social exemplars. There were even occasionally small performances and readings of the plays. In the process of all of this, the Stratfordian Shakespeare was made into a tool through which students at Carlisle were expected to think other thoughts. The Stratfordian Shakespeare was, of course, not the only such tool at Carlisle, but he was an incredibly effective one. More than simple chance or accident, the imposition of the name Shakespeare to replace the name given to the young William, 
uh, by his own people, a name that is nowhere recorded and now seemingly lost forever. More than a mere coincidence, this is a symbol of how the various curriculums of Carlyle were designed to achieve Pratt's vision of killing the Indian and saving the man. Carlyle sought to install the supposed value of civilized. By that, they meant white, Christian, and European cultures by making it clear that the cultures from which its students had come were something of which they should be ashamed by replacing the thoughts they were using to think every subsequent thought. Every board and every sheet of paper at Carlisle was weaponized to this end. In 1883, William, as he would choose to be called for the rest of his life, left Carlisle due to an unspecified illness. From correspondence, we know William became an advocate, advocate for what he saw as the good being done by the school. His name too seems to have proliferated. While there's seemingly no record of a Shakespeare among the tribes of the Northern Plains prior to young William, within just a few generations, more than 900 such Shakespeare's appear in the, in, in the census. For me, the story of William is a reminder of the potentially pernicious nature of what sometimes passes for education and the power of using one set of thoughts to shape others. The story is, I think, sobering, but also not unique. This isn't simply William's story, it's our story. And looking at the at history of the teaching of Shakespeare after Carlyle in the US makes this abundantly clear. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries of US American history, the teaching of Shakespeare has not strayed far from the program of dominance that was so effective at Carlyle. Despite seemingly massive changes in our educational institutions, for example, the desegregation of schools after Brown v. Board of Education, virtually nothing has unseated the presumptions of white supremacy that governed that curriculum at Carlisle. What is more, the arguments underlying the mechanisms of recent school resegregation, things like the value of canonical works in the so-called Western tradition, or the need to preserve, quote, intellectual and cultural heritages, are strikingly similar to many of the arguments for the teaching of Shakespeare that have persisted since Carlyle. Even at this very minute, there is likely a classroom in which the Stratfordian Shakespeare is being deployed to such ends. Now, there's no doubt that Shakespearean performance and criticism have often been tools through which to think and enact revolutionary practices, but all too often the teaching of Shakespeare seems to have continued to rest on troubling assumptions about what needs to be killed and what needs to be saved. And this brings me to my closing and to my question. The cruel and abhorrent genius of Carlyle was the realization that it mattered what thoughts students used to think other thoughts. The question for all of us then is, ah, and my screen share failed me the last second. The question for all of us is, what thoughts are we using to think other thoughts? Darn you, Microsoft PowerPoint. Thank you so much, James. Um, we're clapping in the webinar as well. Darn Microsoft PowerPoint, but thank you for ending us on that really powerful provocation. Um, Would have been better if I hadn't PowerPointed it in the last second, but I appreciate everyone's indulgence. Of course, but no, I, I think, you know, even more seriously, thinking or rethinking of Shakespeare as a tool of dominance of white supremacy um, and hearing you kind of speak to that all year has been really powerful for me. And, and thank you for presenting that to our community today. I think we're now gonna open up to Q&A. Um, as a reminder, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're in our Zoom webinar, please use the Q&A function or the YouTube chat to pose questions and they will be sent to our amazing fellows slash panelists today. Um, I would love to actually start with a question for all of our fellows and anyone or everyone here um, can, can address this, if that sounds good. We have about 11 minutes for questions um, and discussion, so I'm really looking forward to it. The faculty fellows, this theme this year was about being human and or finding or refinding the human in an age of dehumanization. And it's really, you've spoken to that so powerfully today um, and your scholarship really engages with that and thank you. I wonder if you have any reflections about why the stories that you told today, um, why humanities approaches and looking towards the past to understand the present are important. Um, and I think you know answering that question is always hard, but it's also something we've been talking about all year. And I would love to hear more about why stories and conversations are, are important right now. And any
anyone can take that up. I'll jump in quickly uh, and just say, I think for me, a lot of the stories that we are, are talking about and have talked about all year long, um, unpack the, the sort of mythology that we, we were humanized to begin with, right? Um, that we talk a lot about processes of dehumanization in the modern world as though those are new things. And I think the more we look at how we treat everything from the living to the dead, how we treat right, art and science, it reveals that, that dehumanization maybe is more common than the humanizing impulses that we want to ascribe to the humanities. That, that is a really great, uh, great point, uh, James. And uh, uh, from, from my own uh, research uh, on the intersections between uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, film studies, um, I understood just how, um, how much, how important it is to look into the past. Right in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, there was a tremendous push towards uh, biological methods and psychology, and uh, and various methods and tools were uh, deployed to analyze uh, the emotions and the predispositions of of, of people. Uh, right, we could think about the uh, polygraph lie detector, which is a technology that was invented in early 20th century, and just like uh, neuroscience today, it um, uh, the polygraph light detector relied on this nonverbal uh, signs of our body that were then interpreted as more truthful revelations about what the person is really thinking or sensing or what the intentions really are, right? And, and that technology was discredited in the, in the courts. So, and, and in retrospect, there are so many problems, methodological problems with, with this type of technology that was used not only in court, but was also used to analyze spectators' uh, emotions, essentially the ways in which the results of these studies of spectators, uh, like how their pulse changes, how their respiration changes, the results of them were interpreted in such a way as to reinforce cliches of how women perceive genres as opposed to men, right? How um, you know, an uneducated peasant uh, perceives, uh, you know, contemporary film as opposed to, um, you know, like a civilized person in the modern urban metropolis, right? So, so in retrospect, all of this, we see those methodological uh, flaws, but what about today, right? What can we say to contemporary research that seems so powerful and so mesmerizing? And I'll just jump in and say um, that, you know, I frame my application for the fellowship in, in, around the issue of how um, the narratives about creativity that circulate and that sort of motivate copyright law and things like that um, can sort of insufficiently account for the creative, the actual creativity that goes into making something and that can be a dehumanizing process. And then in the course of the fellowship, um, you know, in my own field of ethnomusicology, we've been through this self-critical process. And so my presentation today is also a reflection of thinking about engaging with that process and thinking about my own position and how I'm also spinning a narrative about these things and what might I be sort of foregrounding or emphasizing or erasing. And I think that self-critical attitude is also a really important um, tool that we take away from humanities research. Well, for me, there are two things. One is it is very dehumanizing to think about, well, there are, you know, 10 million deaths in this particular conflict. Um, so one of the goals of my research is to identify maybe a few of them and give us a more complex stories about these people uh, instead of thinking of them as just, you know, a few of the 10 million deaths. Um, and another thing that um, I encounter when I uncover those stories is that the dilemma that each person uh, faced, um, you know, if you didn't have the money uh, to exhume your relatives and, you know, have them buried in your hometown, what do you do? Um, so all these dilemmas, um, you know, rehumanize the stories for me um, and history by extension. Thank you all for those incredibly powerful responses. Um, 
again, it's been an awesome year. And to hear you talk about that uh, publicly is just amazing. And we have a few kind of um, specific questions for specific people in Q&A that I would love to get to um, quickly before we end today. Um, the first is, I would like to ask Dr. Fossum to further elaborate on TRT, um, which uh, TRT World's claim about anonymity. Um, this is a person that is a Turkish scholar who is aware of a kind of misunderstanding among some ethnomusicologists that the claim about anonymity, um, in fact, kind of hides a 100 year long policy of Turkification of folk songs that are different from uh, that are from different cultural origins. So um, given this background, can we regard the claim of anonymity as a non ideological claim is the is the question, Dave. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and I would say, first of all, I think uh, the history of nationalism is definitely going to be something I talk about. It didn't quite fit into my eight minute talk, um, but it's something that's also been written about more frequently by ethnomusicologists. And, um, and certainly there's, um, there's, well, one of the things I want to say about anonymity, I think, is that, you know, something that we, we could think about is that the folk song collection, the majority of the folk song collection in Turkey sort of happened at this time where there's all of this violence and upheaval of population exchanges and, gen well, <laughs> uh, you know, war, all other things. So, um, so, you know, how might that have shaped our documentary record of authorship as well? Um, and certainly another thing, a part of TRT folk music policy has been it's, you know, where there are Kurdish words in Turkish language folk songs, they get changed, edited. Um, and so definitely that's gonna be something I talk about. Um, but one thing that strikes me is about this anonymity narrative that I think has been under, under researched by ethnomusicologists is that it sort of appears as identity blind. And there's really nowadays kind of two narratives about folk music, there's this nationalist narrative that it really kind of reflects the national identity of Turkishness um, and then there's a kind of multiculturalist narrative that Anatolia is this mosaic of different, you know, identities that all kind of um, that go in and, and folk music um, kind of reflects that mosaic, right? Um, but one thing I found in my research that really interested me was that this idea of anonymity sort of crossed that division and people on both sides of that narrative debate sort of uncritically questioned that anonymity idea quite free or, or were equally like unlikely to sort of question it, I would say. There were people on both sides who did question it. Um, and so, uh, and, I, and I also don't mean to claim that it's not ideological. I'm certainly gonna continue to sort of um, put those ideas out there and, and um, find data that sort of complicates that idea as much as possible in my book. But I also just want to put my own position out there and sort of allow readers to critically reflect upon how my position might also be shaping the kind of um, critique that I'm putting out there. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so I, I believe that uh, this is a question for Anna. Can an understanding of the cognitive impact of music and music therapy bring progress to research concerning the connection between neuroscience and social emotional development or other similar humanistic questions? Yes, this is a really, really important and interesting question. And of course, sound is such a crucial dimension of our film experience, right? Uh, and sounds that uh, actually evokes uh, multi-sensory other experiences. Sound can dictate to us the experience of space, the experience of balance, how far or how close something is, right? The textures of, of things, all of those, all of those qualities, sensory qualities could be conveyed uh, through sound. And um, uh, this question about uh, therapy and what therapy actually does, music therapy, it's, it's really a, a very important and fascinating one. Um, and I mean, I'm a historian and my, most of my research is on, on the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and um, at that time, um, some of this uh, research in the emergent field of uh, physiological psychology, uh, like in today's neuroscience, uh, wanted to emphasize this um, 
pre-cognitive, pre-rational uh, sensory and emotional reactions that, that are happening as uh, we attune at ourselves to uh, artistic forms. Music being uh, uh, one of the most important types of um, uh, arts uh, explained in, in this way, right? And, and researchers in modern dance, uh, for example, began to explore uh, this uh, uh, sensations uh, uh, that, that, you, that you have when you uh, move uh, uh, with music uh, and, uh, and, and, and kind of feelings that that movement uh, uh, gives rise to, right? You can think about um, this remarkable educator, uh, Emil Jacques Dalcroz, who uh, um, used dance and movement to uh, explore the embodied perception of musical rhythm and really taught his students and his workshop to produce very, very complicated rhythms uh, with different uh, through gestures, right? And, and, and his, his school at the turn of the 20th century opened uh, new avenues for exploration for modern dance. Uh, but uh, you know, subsequently, some of this uh, uh, kind of li liberating uh, uh, views of the body as attuning uh, itself and, and kind of uh, embracing its biological rhythms and what's not have been co-opted by uh, uh, body cultures of Nazi Germany. And it's, it's, it's also a very interesting question about historical framing of all of these experiments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And we're at time today, but I hope that y'all will um, indulge me, Lynn and James, I would absolutely love to hear a reflection from y'all on the fellows program or anything that you have that are final thoughts um, for our uh, uh, attendees today. Um, maybe James, James or Lynn, whoever wants to take the mic first. I, yeah, I, I can start. I just, um, it's been an amazing program. I think, you know, I never had encountered a Turku before. I didn't know what neurocinematics was. Uh, I couldn't have said anything intelligent about how we treat the remains of the dead and what that might say for us. And, and all of those things have now entered into, I don't know, they become really important things. So things that I'm now reading about and looking into, and not that I'll ever be an expert on, but I think uh, my, my own scholarship, my own life is infinitely enriched by those. And so I just, people out there apply for the program and, and also even outside of that, right? Find these, these transdisciplinary conversations because it really does begin to change, I think, what we look at and how we look at it. And that's been a really powerful experience. Same here. Um, I agree with James. And I just want to add something um, about the community um, spirit that we have and how we share our works and we uh, give each other tips beyond just, you know, the topics that we are uh, specialized in, but also how to navigate um, our lives as a scholar and as anything else <laughs> that um, any roles that we uh, have in you know non-academic life so thank you thank you thank you so much all um, thank you Dave thank you Anna thank you James thank you Lynn um, for being here and in community for the past year thank you for these wonderful presentations questions and stories um, it's it's really been interesting to see where each of your stories overlaps with one another, the directions that your research has taken and will take in the future. And the IHR really hopes that you'll consider joining us for our other end of semester events. If you're interested, those are available at ihr.asu.edu slash events. Thank you again, especially to our ground control team today, Selena Asuna, our IHR coordinator, and our live stream expert, Joseph Carter from Livestream Success, for ensuring that our um, event went smoothly today. To our audience, I hope that you've had uh, as amazing an event um, and uh, participated in discussion as much as I do, and I hope that you will seek out the IHR should you have any interest in any of our print funding programs, but especially our fellows. Thank you all. <laughs>